there. Can folks see that? Good, great. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, uh, kudos to you all for um, doing this meeting on Zoom. Um, it's, it's become kind of uh, increasingly the way of business over the last few months, as no doubt a lot of you know. Um, I am actually a fan. I, I think it's I think it's got some some really good qualities, and I hope tonight goes well in terms of being able to see and hear and and take some messages away and and think about some things. Um, uh, because I think the forum you know lends itself well to folks who maybe can't get to an in-person group uh, at, at particular times. So as much as I would have liked to have been there, um, thanks for the opportunity to to have this chat today. Um, uh, I don't like asking for things, but I'll, I will. Um, that is, we have a website, it's called ifiwertom.ca. You may know that it was funded by CIHR, which is code for taxpayers' money. And we built this website and we gifted it to the BC Foundation for Prostate Cancer. Um, and we still administer the site. Um, if you get a chance, take a look at the site. It's really helpful because it's meant to mirror some of the things that you get at in-person prostate cancer support groups, um, which we're a big fan of. We've done a lot of work with the, with the groups over the year and we tried to build something for folks that maybe couldn't get to an in-person group. The other reason is that there's a, uh, there is a survey that's available for you to fill out at the moment um, and it does engage issues around mental health and it's anonymous, but I think um, during this time, during the, the kind of the lockdown time, it's really important that we get some data to best understand some of the experiences of fellas who are uh, going through prostate cancer in terms of their mental health. It only takes 10 minutes. You could win $500. We've been running these, these little um, surveys for, I think it's nearly two years now. And we seem to be giving all of that $500 every time across the border It's going to Alberta and Ontario. I would love to be able to give someone $500 here in BC. So if you get a chance to fill out the survey, that'd be, that'd be great. In terms of um, what I want to talk about tonight, um, 10 deliverables. I, I basically want to talk about two important points about men's health in a general context. I want to talk about three eyes and their injury, interiority, and isolation, and they're things that happen in terms of men's mental health. I wanna talk about four lessons and caveats from community health. And prostate cancer support groups, in my view, are one of the leading examples of men's health, community health, um, doing a really good job. And the last thing I wanna do, I wanna share an, an e-health resource that's aimed at men's mental health um, and specifically depressive symptoms. So just in terms of backing up in, in thinking about men's health, um, there's a couple of things, there's a couple of myths and, and I'd like to just kind of give a bit of a caveat around these. One of the things is we say, often say that we should do men's health because men don't live as long as women. And I think it's very short sighted. Um, because 20 years ago, the difference was 7.4 years between men's and women's life expectancy with women living longer. And t right now it's about 4.6 years. So the gap is closing and I might not be in my lifetime, but I would imagine that at some point it's going to even up. That gap is closing. So to say we're all living longer and the gap is closing between the sex differences about life expectancy. Far more helpful from our perspective in terms of doing men's health is thinking about what we can assign those 4.6 years to in terms of the difference and thinking about how we might intervene with guys to help them live longer lives. So in order, the things that kill us earlier are heart disease, suicide, motor vehicle accidents, infectious diseases, most often HIV, and liver failure, most often, most often secondary to alcohol overuse. What's interesting about all of those things for me is that they're amenable to solutions, to prevention and, uh, and to treatments. The other thing that strikes me is that we often talk about them separately, but in our experience of researching all of those areas, we find that they can often be intertwined in people's lives. 
The other thing is we say that these are things that impact men in greater numbers, but of all of those things, I see them directly impacting families, um, women, children, other men in and around those guys' lives. So my point being, if we intervene well and we do good work in terms of men's health, we can make a difference to everybody, not just the guys, so to speak. The other thing is there's a real myth that men don't go to the doctor. And um, this one is, is, is pervasive because if you say, if you tell this story often enough, it becomes the truth. And even for young men who buy into the idea of not going to the doctor, um, it can be really, it can be really, um, really difficult for those guys to access care. So this is from the Hunt, um, Huffington's Post, this particular um, slide. And it suggests that men don't go to the doctor for a variety of reasons. The usual things, too busy to go, they might find out something's wrong. But what they've reported is 48% of the sample. So you can see down the bottom that 52% of men said nothing would stop them from having an annual checkup with their doctor. So we tell, we report the outliers in a way. And so we tell this story a lot. And it's the one that is, is considered newsworthy, um, but it's not the empirical truth. If you look at it, between the ages of 20 and 45, the times when we're most likely at work and kind of consumed with family, fair enough, we don't see the doctor as often. We're not, not as connected to the healthcare system. But if you look at it, when we get into our fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh decade, we're there in pretty much the same numbers as women. So it's kind of the story that's being told doesn't represent a lot of guys, and especially guys who are experiencing prostate cancer. Many of you are really deeply connected to the healthcare system um, and, and, and able to ask for help and able to have good collaborative therapeutic relationships. And that's not the story that gets told very often. The other thing we, do, we tend to sort of ask people how they feel about their health. And mental health is an interesting one for this. The guys actually rate their mental health higher than women. But if you look at the percentages of people who are experiencing what we call health inequities, um, so, you know, um, Indigenous folks, for example, they experience a lot, uh, a lot less in terms of their mental health. So they rate it much lower. And the same plays out in terms of income. The basic truth is the poorer you are, the more likely you are to rate your mental health lower. So these inequities are really important because within the category of men and also women, we need to think about, you know, how they play out, how some people are disadvantaged and how we might want to think about different resources for different folks. And that brings up that idea of equality. So people talk about equality a lot you know, about how everything should be equal. And a public health care system such as what we have here, absolutely. You know, things are, things are services are free. It creates a, an opportunity for everyone to access. But what we've learned over time is that there's equity issues. So inequities in health where people might need additional resources or they might need specific resources to help them access some of the health care pieces. And we don't talk about it that often with men, um, but we should, because there's a lot of inequities within the category of men that we might want to address. So cutting to the chase a little bit, you know, um, in terms of thinking about mental health, one of, the thing, one of the things that's quite staggering for me still is, is the idea that um, in suicide, like men's suicide at three times the rate of, of women, um, and of those guys who suicide, 60% of them have actually been in touch with the healthcare system directly in the 12 months prior to their death. So there's, it raises the question about, you know, whether services are, uh, are really pandering or, 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 or getting to these guys in ways that would prevent, you know, the outcome, the drastic outcome of suicide. And I'm not suggesting, you know, all mental health ends in this way, mental health challenges and in this way, but we know that there's a, a deep connection between severe depression, for example, and suicide in men. The, there's just a little note there, an article that was run. Um, it's, a, it's a great little study. It's a great reminder of how complex health, healthcare seeking is. 
and it was run out of UBC and, and uh, we um, basically interviewed guys who were in the waiting room about to go in and see their general practitioner, their doctor, and seven of the 104 men disclosed suicidal intent. So thinking about, thinking about suicide. When they went into the doctor, saw the doctor, left, and then we checked the notes. And in those seven men who disclosed suicidal intent in the waiting room, none of them mentioned it in the consultation. So again, it's just raising that issue is that, you know, in mental health, it's not always easy to articulate what's going on for you. It's not always easy to communicate it and, you know, to, uh, to find a, a solution or to start a conversation about therapy or help. Anxiety is an interesting one. I think, you know, nowadays um, with this lockdown, it's been, been interesting. In the simplest terms, anxiety is concern, worry about the future. And I differentiate it from depression. Depression tends to be about the past. Same thing, regret, worry. So you can understand that, that for anxiety, it might creep into a lot of guys who are going through illness and prostate cancer being one of those illnesses. And it bears out in the literature. We found that um, pre-treatment, really high incidence or prevalence of anxiety amongst guys with prostate cancer, so 27%. Um, on treatment, 15%. And then post-treatment, it sort of bumps up again at 18, nearly 19%. So just to say that, you know, anxiety is... Uh, is treatable for sure and, 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 and does impact a lot of guys because we know that when we've got anxiety, we're not great at decision making. Um, we, tend, we can be a little bit impulsive, be quite irritable. Um, and so it can, it can really have some, uh, some detrimental effects on everything that we do. So anxiety is one of the ones that, that's kind of not talked about quite, quite the way depression is, but it's definitely something that we're seeing. The other one is depression, so depressive symptoms. And we see a lot in guys. So in terms of the prevalence in prostate cancer, it runs between 15 and 18%, which is about five, uh, which is around 13, 14% higher than what we see in the general population. And again, you know, these are, these are related to living a longer life, but also having an illness. And oftentimes, you know, um, being caught in some of those, uh, some of those uh, more lower affects that, are, that occur when we do, deal with things like prostate cancer. So just to say there's, there's some, some issues there that we might want to think about. When guys turn up to a prostate cancer support group, oftentimes they'll come see you at the beginning when they're trying to make a treatment decision. So the data would suggest that many of those fellows are anxious um, and, it, and it would also suggest that you know, there's certainly some depressive symptoms in the room in terms of the guys who show up. Um, and it's just a, useful to be mindful of it because we can be really helpful in terms of just reaching out to see how people are doing. It can be one of the basic things that we can do in, within those formats. So are we missing male anxiety and depression? M my argument would be, yeah, we probably are. Um, I'm not suggesting that the only route to suicide is depression, but we diagnose men with depression at half the rate of women and men suicide at three to four times the rate of women. It's a, what we call a discordant relationship. And if you look at the statistics across Canada in every age group, it's mind boggling how many men suicide versus, many, versus women. It's interesting to know also that the suicide rate amongst women is on the increase. So I'm not doing an either or here, but the epidemiology of this is, is, is really important to pay attention to. So we call them discordant relationships. And I say the difference, you know, the, the understanding the pathways between depression and suicide, if we can just unpack what we call the black box, the flight recorder, um, to try and get upstream to prevent these suicides by better understanding depression, anxiety in guys, um, I think we'd, uh, we'd be doing a really good job. You know, just as a footnote, I never knew the black box was orange. It actually, like, it makes sense, right? you know, it'd be easier to find. And there's more than one of them for each flight. But again, you know, sometimes we get caught in, in our ideas about what something is in terms of the black box as well. So just, I think, to be creative around how we think about reaching out to people in terms of helping them with, uh, with issues around depressive symptoms and anxiety is really important. 
over the years we've done a lot of work with guys and this is i'm just going to share this these three eyes with you injury interiority and isolation and it just maps what happens for a lot of men so these guys are young men they're not men with prostate cancer but just give you a bit of an idea about some of the things that they say and mention so when we when we do studies with guys we often give them cameras or these days they just take photographs with their with their phones and then they we interview them and they narrate their experience so all of these guys experience experience suicidality um, so thinking about suicide um, you know uh, planning and some had had attempts so in terms of injury um, oftentimes we don't talk about injury um, in men um, and guys are often reticent to to sort of disclose details about uh, about um, what's occurred for them. So many of the guys we spoke to had events that you might think, you know, we get past and, but these guys sort of had these cumulative events that never quite went away. So this is a picture of a, of a condemned, you know, uh, uh, apartment block. And the guy uh, who's only 24, he just draws this, this, uh, uh, this alignment to this condemned apartment block by saying, you know, uh, I think it's just kind of what happened to me. You kind of feel like you're, you're useful, you're doing good, and then it's just, um, it's just eventually you just end up being abandoned. You're going to be abandoned. And what he's doing is he's referencing some changes in his life whereby his parents divorced, neither of them expressed a, an interest in having him live with them. Um, and then he was kind of caught in this quandary of was in a relationship and then that broke up and then this abandonment that kind of became cyclic. Oftentimes when those things occur, guys will ruminate on them. They'll think about them long and hard. And then they'll often look internally for the solution. So we call it interiority. So at a time when you're often very depleted in terms of your own resources, driving the problem inward and looking for solution. I won't read all of this, but it's just a, a really lovely quote that talks to a padlock in saying, you know, if you can unlock the padlock, then you can find a way to avoid the self-harm and the suicide. But when, you know, if you, you've got to know the combination. So again, it's this, this work that's going on internally to try and work through uh, the depression that this guy's experiencing, 31 year old South Asian fellow um, from, from Vancouver. So again, you know, the, the more you do it, the more you drive internally and, and kind of deny injury, but drive internally to try and look at it. The words like, you know, boys don't cry, suck it up, push it down, come up. You get further and further away from your emotions and then it just gets hard to recognize ways to manage just the most basic of things. And that's what occurs for a lot of these guys. Um, and then the last thing is, is isolation. Um, and this from a, a 34 year old gentleman who is working and he works with hundreds of people each day, but he's driving home and he has a profound isolation that he feels. So the negative feelings when the sun sets and is separated from the world. And so he puts this forward in saying, you know, how, how um, uh, isolated he feels from everyone around him. So that idea that somehow that guys, um, the isolated guy is the lonely guy in the corner with no mates is, uh, is not what we see. Um, sure, that does bear out at some level, but, but oftentimes it'll be people who are seemingly surrounded by people that are feeling quite isolated um, and caught in their own, their own thoughts about, you know, depressive symptoms and the like. Joanna did a, a similar thing, you know, a theory that talked about, you know, when you feel like you're burdensome on someone, on people around you, and you have a low level of belongingness, they are two of the things that collide to create the opportunity that you, you might be uh, increasing the risk of suicide and the, uh, the risk of self-harm. It's interesting, you know, um, groups do such a great job of, of, of putting those things out. You know, groups such as prostate cancer support groups bring guys in and a sense of belongingness. And they also do a great job of offering advice or helping people think through their decisions uh, in really measured ways um, that, that never puts uh, a feeling of burdensome. 
Yeah, and there's no indebtedness. So I think, you know, thinking about, you know, how that works is really important within the group. Um, when, we, when we screen guys clinically for, uh, for depression, we use a nine item uh, piece called the PHQ-9. It's the one we typically use. Um, it's interesting, it's a generic screen. And our belief is that we're actually missing some of the things that show up regularly in men. Um, we believe that early on, we often see guys with substance use issues. We often see them angry, irritable, um, risk taking and, and really shutting down emotionally. So, you know, sometimes when you go to a physician, they're not necessarily picking up the depression, you know, in a guy because it looks and feels a bit differently. So just a bit of a schema there on those fronts. So we run what's called a men's uh, depression risk scale. It's got 22 items and it does look at irritability, anger, alcohol overuse or, or substance overuse as, as some of the things that, that we see. So again, this is borne out really well. We've, we've run this uh, in Canada and Australia and it shows that we have a better sensitivity to men's depression using this scale than, than anything that's, uh, that's probably out there in terms of generic screens. We've also done some work um, here with prostate cancer fellas um, in terms of looking at uh, some of the issues um, for them in terms of depression. And what we do see is that um, there are some male specific depressive symptoms, emotional suppression uh, and anger and aggression do bear out in many guys who've got prostate cancer as signs of depressive symptoms. And we also find that this is particularly the case in guys who have comorbidities. So as we get into our sixth, seventh, eighth decades, the chances of us having prostate cancer plus something else, be it diabetes, heart disease or the like, um, you know, it, it, it raises with time. And so comorbidities are uh, another factor that amplify our potential for, for depression. Um, the other one that, that's interesting that we, the, uh, we collected data here um, across Canada for um, was looking at you know this relationship between anger and and uh, and depression and anxiety and the interesting thing for me is that um, anger anger is kind of socially affirmed as being something that guys do regularly and it's it's kind of um, in some spaces it's celebrated if you look at sports and competitive sports and contact sports is often celebrated you know um, but in some ways, it's also condoned, right? So, and it's also outlawed in some in some contexts. And so, the guys basically what sh what showed up was it wasn't necessarily the fact of losing your temper; it was the shame of having lost your temper, which was making it more likely that you would isolate. And I think it's just interesting to think about because I I see it. Um, as, as disenfranchising a lot of guys. So again, and this is in the context of guys with prostate cancer. So along the way, there's no doubt with the trajectory, um, lots of challenges and lots of, um, you know, episodes where people, you know, express themselves with, with anger because it's been what they do and what we, uh, what, we, what we see most often. So what do we know about services? You know, um, there, there is uh, a lot of services out there it's often a, a really fragmented pathway to mental health care services, you know, in terms of finding and finding the help, even if you've got a connection to specialists in prostate cancer or other diseases. So the thing that happens is a lot of guys tend to go it alone. Um, I won't go through this entire slide, but I will say, you know, as much as I don't like the broken leg scenario, it bears out in mental health. If you continue to try and walk on something that's broken, you know, uh, it's not going to get better. And that's what we find when guys leave it and they've got depressive symptoms and they're getting worse and they leave the help seeking or they can't get the help they need, then it tends to get worse. Um, and so that's, uh, that's something that we want to try and avoid if we can. So we talk to guys about the good things they do rather than trying to um, get into some of the nuts and bolts of, of, of the stigma that goes with potentially with having a mental illness or just being a little bit depressed. 
So we tend to talk to them about things that they do really well. Most guys want to be a good provider. They want to be a protector of their family. They want to be loyal. Uh, they want to be responsible. They want to be logical. They want to have. Well, they want to show courage. They want to show strength. So we really work with guys to try and help them in all of those spaces as a way to saying, hey, if we can help you develop some effective self-management skills, then you know that'd be a great way forward, rather than any indebtedness trying to just work through with guys. So that's that's kind of what we do. So some tips for you when guys you know show up or guys in your life might be. Um, showing some depressive symptoms. You know, I think um, affirmation is that lots of guys experience this. This is way more common than we talk about uh, for fellas. And it can be episodic. It's not necessarily some kind of biological determinant that's causing this. The permission to talk is really key. And in my experience, prostate cancer support groups are great at this. They just, they allow guys to talk and, and partners to talk about things that matter. Um, and that's really, really important. So the fact that, you know, we're advising the same things, we've probably learned a, a lot from the groups over the years. Courage, as I said, strength-based. It's not about deficits. There's very little point telling fellas what they can't do or what they're doing wrong if you're looking for them to self-manage effectively. The trigger myth, people say to me, they go, oh, I'm worried, but I don't want to say anything. It might trigger him, you know, to be worse, uh, to... Uh, to attempt self-harm, untrue, completely unfounded. In fact, when we talk to guys, one of the things that we, 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 we hear from them most often is that they're frightened by the thoughts they are having uh, around depressive mood, around you know, suicidal thoughts. And so the opportunity and the permission to talk up and speak around those things is, is absolutely critical. So don't be frightened about offering that that opportunity for guys around you to do that um, it won't trigger and you're not on the hook for the solution that's the other bit so you know it's really just sometimes it's just a matter of listening the thing when guys disclose what we've found is it's really important to follow up you know never leave them hanging if a fella's disclosed things you know about how he's feeling then the follow-up should occur you know in the within the next sort of you know 24 48 hours to to just check in um, you know, and see how things are going. Uh, oftentimes there's a little bit of uh, doubt about, you know, what you've said and whether you should have said anything. So it's that affirmation needs to occur after the event as well. Um, you know, professional, you know, and, and community spaces um, provide opportunities and resilience is a really overused term, but, but it, it is part of the game plan of most guys is to, you know, develop a kind of a muscle around resilience. And that takes professional and often, oftentimes community help as well. Um, I'm just checking the time here. We'll still got to, I'll, I'll run through for probably about another seven or eight minutes. So I think that probably work and take some questions. Um, four lessons that we've learned from, from folks like you running prostate cancer support groups and some caveats. Um, so men's sheds really, really do a great job of doing they connect guys by doing so it's activity based and so i, I noticed i, I kind of heard at the front end that there's a kind of a walking group and things like things like that that also you know working with the prostate cancer support group really important doing is such an important way because the blokes at the at the sheds they talk to us about shoulder to shoulder how they they'll just be next to each other and they'll talk but it's kind of like they're doing something. There's kind of like almost a third person thing going on. So I think it's really a great way to connect. The only thing I'd say is the caveat to it is that we never want to get too busy. We never want to be so busy that we don't give the room for blokes to, to talk and connect. And, and that includes silences. It's okay. I see, I see it play out really well. One of the, one of the early studies we did with support groups was um, uh, we went around to all the support groups in British Columbia and observed them. And um, we noticed that the connections, a lot of the connections occurred in the tea, that, like when you have a cup of tea and the, the little coffee break, because the guys get one-on-one -on -one and they talk about some stuff. Um, and so it's kind of interesting. You just need those breaks are really important because they create the room for some of those, uh, some of those connections that the large group might not do. 
the, the permission and affirmation of other men, it shifts masculine norms. And by that, I mean, um, we often do this really poor job of representing men's health. So you'll see on this slide, you know, uh, an advertisement out of the States, which is only two or three years old. And it says, this year, thousands of men will die from stubbornness. And this placard is trying to encourage blokes to, you know, go get tested for, or screened for, for various cancers. Um, it, so if that's the normative, you know, that, that guys die because they're stubborn, then a lot of guys kind of buy into that and go, yeah, well, of course I wouldn't go. But what groups do, and prostate cancer support groups, they break with that. They change the milieu. And so they create a space that doesn't rely on those traditional masculine stereotypes. In fact, you know, it's a safe place where you're able to have the conversations that you really need to have. And so oftentimes the leaders of prostate cancer support groups, they come in and they go, oh, John, you know, we're worried. You know, blokes come once and they go, they never come back. And I go, what an amazing remedy you've provided. You know, number one, if someone can come and get what they want and then move on, that, that's pretty good success, right? Notwithstanding, I appreciate you want to keep the group, you know, members there, a core group, but not everyone's going to stay. The guys that benefit, you know, from the, the environment you create and the, and the ability to chat is fantastic. And it doesn't mean they'll be back but it does mean they've got a really good opportunity to get something from you that they cannot get anywhere else. So just a, just a, a shout out. And, and that's the study from 2008 that we did with the groups across BC. And it kind of it bore out that, uh, you know, the sustainability was all wrapped around this idea that you had to have a hundred guys show up at the group. But, you know, in honesty, in all honesty, the groups do a great job and, and, and so the, the guys that come through and don't stay are an important part of the work that happens. Um, literacy is the other one. You know, there's this kind of thing that we say, oh, if, uh, if you have low literacy, if you don't understand medical terms, um, it, it actually heightens the stigma, especially associated with mental, mental illness. Um, and, and it does bear out in the studies that we've done. Um, I would just say, the answer to all of that is to to know and to work with the men's language and again i'd just say that the group's doing an amazing job of this um i was a clinician for 20 years i i, I worked in the er um for 20 years and I, I vividly remember going to my first prostate cancer support group when i was doing a phd and the language that was being used around gleason scores and psas and um, a whole bunch of mnemonics were being used, um, clearly showed that guys understood the language uh, uh, better than a lot of clinicians. Um, and so really interesting. So you teach guys who come to the group the language they need to converse with the, with the healthcare professionals and also uh, opportunities to contextualise, you know, what's going on for them. So it's really important in that way. We see the same thing. We do work with veterans coming back from Afghanistan in the Veterans Transition Program, UBC. And we never talk to them about depression. We talk about dropping your baggage. We talk about carrying a heavy load. And so these are guys who are coming back to civilian life, trying to reacclimatize to civilian life after time in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan and, and, and war-torn areas. And so, again, we talk about release and, and we talk about dropping your baggage. We don't talk about processes around, you know, uh, therapeutic interactions and the like. We, we tend to talk in the language that the guys know. And, and, and again, I just, my cave it would be with the groups is don't assume that the language is known, you know, around all the biomedical pieces of, of uh, uh, prostate cancer and, 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 and really focus on the teaching of that for the, for the guys new, new to the group. The one last thing uh, around the groups, um, uh, or around community-based pieces, is, you know, we, we try to tailor um, to the setting and the context of like what I mentioned at the front end there around health inequities. So, you know, just another example, we, we work with um, uh, predominantly Indigenous fellows who are, who are challenged by um, homelessness and substance use issues in the downtown east side at the Dudes Club. And they come in, go get a haircut and a feed. 
and um, every two weeks and they sort of chat and they chat about health and all the things that are going on for them, a way of bringing them into, you know, some of the health promotion things that we do. So again, just trying to think about, you know, the guys who, who might not be so resourced to get to a group, who, who, who might not be able to get to one, you might want to think about, you know, some of the ways in which we can, we can better target those fellas to give them the opportunities that, that, many, of us, uh, that many of us enjoy. Um, an example might be, um, we run a group out at Richmond, a prostate cancer support group out at Richmond, and it attracts predominantly uh, Asian Asian fellas and partners, and and um, uh, yeah, and, and those are often done in Cantonese, um, and and again, without some of, without that kind of group, you know, there would be uh, there would be as pockets of the population that would be missing out on all the good things that happen at groups. So just in terms of thinking about that. Um, in terms of you know online, the, the the one I want to mention is a thing called Heads Up Guys. It comes out of UBC, UBC Psychiatry. We built this with the help of Movember. It's um it's been gangbusters. This one, um, people um, seem to really like it. Get a lot of traffic to the website. It's very plain in terms of its instructions. It just offers advice about people's experiences related to depression, related to anxiety. Um, it offers uh, help for partners of guys who, uh, who might benefit by having additional information. Um, it's all about action. It's all about taking some strategies and building a team, um, things that guys align to, uh, and offers practical tips. It's interesting, you know, when we look at the traffic to the website, um, it, the things that people do on this website is they do self-checks. Predominantly. So guys want to know what's going on for them. And this is probably easier than a consult with a GP. So because we're using the same tools the GP would use and it's a self-assessment tool. And then based on your score, we then direct you to some, some resources that are, that are on the site. And then you'll see that the biggest traction is to those management sites, like those management strategies. So there's a lot of self-help going on here and it's, and it's really useful. Now you might not need this, but if there were guys in your life that you thought could benefit by having a look, it'd be very easy to sort of share the URL with them and just you know maybe direct them. We get a ton of traffic. It's it's a it's a big it's a big pull in terms of academic websites that that oftentimes don't draw a big crowd. This one does, and what's interesting here, we get over 150 visits a day that suggest. Um, suicidal intent by the search terms that the people are, are putting in and there's 35 visits a day now more recently with organic searches that are looking at marijuana use and depression so there is there is a whole piece around a, a component of marijuana which is CBD um, uh, being used uh, to help with anxiety for, for example, and there's trials going on. So you legalise something and then you're on the hook for the empirical evidence to try and, you know, show effect. So it's, it's just interesting that, that we're moving in that, that space. Um, I've, pre I've presented to you a case that is predominantly about gender tonight. Um, it's predominantly about how men are socialised to be men. Um, but notwithstanding that, I think there's a lot of, uh, sex-based, and by that I mean biology-based rationales for why guys might experience depression, suicidality, anxiety. My suggestion is, is that we don't um, we don't uh, put them as competing, but that we think of them as potentially interacting, um, and that we focus on the things around gender um, in trying to understand behaviours. Um, but also notwithstanding that, that the biology does kick in for some men, um, you know, to impact. So I'll close out um, uh, and, and delighted to take questions. Um, and just to, to remind you that that opportunity to fill out this very brief questionnaire, I promise you it's only 10 minutes and we've all got a little bit more time on our hands these days, um, uh, to fill out the mental health survey that's there. Um, just We're trying to get a bit of a sense of, you know, some of the, some of the issues that are COVID-19 specific, 
Um, just as a footnote, I saw some data that was collected from neurologists uh, about their experience of, uh, uh, of COVID-19. I just saw the numbers, uh, I think it was two days ago. Anyway, um, just to say that many of us are challenged um, by the things that are going on right now. Um, and I don't, uh, from the data I saw, that definitely there's, there's no subgroup or, or groups that are immune to some of the challenges around anxiety and, and suicidality and depression. Um, so again, just saying that it's an unprecedented time that, that uh, can exacerbate some of, those, some of those feelings of isolation and all that for, for all of us. Um, just final footnote, we've got a vibrant Twitter feed at, at Men's Health UBC. Um, by all means, follow us. We, we put out some really good content. It's not all our own stuff. We curate about 60% and we create about 40% as our, as our homegrown spruik talent and we, we put that out but it will keep you up to date with all things men's health and uh, uh, it's similar to what I've uh, shared with you today. So thanks very much.